What makes a camera good? Is it dynamic range, internal codex, rolling shutter? Does the perfect camera even exist? This is the Kinefinity Mivo LF Mark II. And it's a lot of camera for the price. In fact, it might be one of the most cost-effective cameras you can buy. And to put it through its paces, we're shooting in New York. We're also going to talk about how to make a good business decision when buying a camera. Here's what you get for $6,000. It's a 6K large format 3x2 cinema camera. Most people are going to spend about $9,000 to get the base package with batteries, screen and media. What's the kit capable of? See for yourself. We are starting in New York, the state, not the city. I'm shooting with DZO Film's Cata Ace full frame zooms in PL. So keep that in mind. These images are a mix of the Marvo's quality and the Cata's character. I'm presenting clips in the aspect ratio I shot them in. You'll see some scope, some 16 by nine, and a lot of open gate three by two. This shot is a great example of how well three by two works with a nice fast lens. You get more of that large format look with 3x2 than you do with 16x9, as you've got more height and room to frame foreground and background elements. It should be noted the cutters only open up to T2.9. All right, into the city now. This is shot at 112 frames per second at UHD. You can access higher frame rates if you start dropping the resolution further. How does the camera handle overexposure? This shot is overexposed, accidentally, I might add, but the highlights have a really nice soft roll-off. There's no harsh clipping or artifacts. It's nice to know the camera still delivers an attractive image when exposed improperly. I tend to shoot with the white balance set to 5500 Kelvin most of the time, even in environments with different lighting. This image is also really dark. How does it respond to changes in color temperature? Very well. I'm going to make these adjustments with just the gamma tool. First, I'll fix the exposure. Then I'll add blue to correct the yellowy orange tint. So this is an underexposed image with mixed lighting that you just know is gonna have terrible CRI, but it holds up very well when corrected. The same corrections have also been made to these images. What about gross underexposure? Want to see what this image looked like before I started grading it? Yeah, wow. Let me show you how this image was graded. With exposure this bad, I'll use a curve as I can better target the shadows without destroying highlight information. As you can see, there's a lot of detail in this image. It does look nasty and muddy. That's mostly because it's the subway. The subway is brown and muddy, but also this is to be expected when we're pulling so deep from the image's shadows. Adding contrast returns those muddy details to a part of the image's tonality where that lack of detail makes more sense to the eye. I'll add a layer mixer and a qualifier so I can control the highlights separately. This allows me to mix the image's original exposure for those highlights back in with the corrected image. And finally, this image needs some noise reduction. I'll use a mix of temporal and spatial. Now, I'm not saying this image is beautiful or that this grade is finished, but it's definitely usable. The Marvo handles overexposure and underexposure well. Back to some scope footage. Welcome to the top of the Empire State Building. This camera has beautiful color, but things are about to get dark. But again, I can be confident of the camera's low light performance. This is the camera's high base ISO, 5120. I'm shooting at T2.9. Ideally, I'd like a prime lens that opens up to something like F1.4. That would be a full three stops faster. On top of that, most of this is shot at 48 frames per second. So lose another stop off your exposure for that. And then again, on top of that, I often shoot with a 90 degree shutter when handheld to make post stabilization look better. I'm counting at least five stops of exposure loss compared to if I was shooting with a 180 degree shutter at 24 frames per second on a nice f1.4 prime lens. That's quite a lot of exposure loss, but I'm not having any problems. So the camera's low light performance isn't just about being able to shoot in dark environments. It's about having the latitude to shoot higher frame rates, faster shutter speeds and narrower apertures. This is an interesting shot. This time lapse was not shot as a time lapse. This is handheld resting on a brick wall at 135 mil at 48 frames per second with a 90 degree shutter. So it was originally shot as slow motion. It's been stabilized and sped up in post and it still looks good. Now, cinema cameras don't tend to have internal noise reduction. So an image of the Marvo might look noisier than say, for example, a Sony A7 that performs noise reduction internally. That's by design. It's so you can apply superior noise reduction in post. 
The camera's noise doesn't look too bad. I'll typically remove more chroma noise and leave some of the luma noise as it has a film-like quality. Here's another wonder shot, a sea of blackness that has an incredible amount of detail when lifted in the grade. Moving on, there's a lot to see in film in Washington Park. This is all shot at 6K 48 frames per second. The camera will run all day in this configuration. That's a lot of data. How about dynamic range? Highlights are handled nicely on the dancer's skin. In this shot, the water fountain is held. Now, of course, this is all dependent on the exposure that you set on the camera. But given how much reach there is in the shadows, I can confidently expose to the right. The only thing clipping here in this image are the specular highlights on his trombone, which is to be expected. Now, I know these aren't scientific tests of dynamic range. They're just casual observations. Kinefinity quotes 14 plus stops but the usable range is closer to 12 once the noise floor is factored. Gerald Undone has a great video on the Edge 6K that uses the same sensor. In that video, he tests the dynamic range. But it's important to remember that you can still clip a camera with, for example, 15 stops of dynamic range. So available stops is one thing, but how the camera handles under and overexposure is also important. How about rolling shutter? Well, here's the camera's Achilles heel. Yes, Jello is definitely visible on this handheld footage. Readout is always longer on a full frame sensor, but the readout in this camera, eh, it's okay. There are a couple of ways that you could mitigate this. Number one, shoot on a gimbal. Number two, if you had gyro data for this camera, you can actually fairly effectively neutralize rolling shutter using tools within Resolve or third party tools like Gyroflow. Or option three, you could use a crop of the sensor to reduce the readout time. Now, on that third point, you might be thinking, hey, won't that limit? how wide a lens you can use on the camera now if you're using a crop of the sensor? Well, not necessarily. Because the Marvo has such a short flange, you could fit a speed booster, and Kinefinity even make their own, and then get a full frame field of view in a super 35mm crop mode. Something to keep in mind, but these shots are a torture test for rolling shutter, as the camera is being handled roughly, and the shot is filled with straight lines and geometric shapes that make it really easy to see the rolling shutter. On the other hand, I hardly notice any rolling shutter in these shots. The camera is being handled smoother, but the environment is more irregular, making it harder to see the jello. By the way, Kinefinity records images using the Ari Log 3 curve. So I'm using Resolve Color Management with the Ari Log 3 input color space selected. Skin looks great. It sometimes has a slight orange bias, but it's easy to correct that with a hue shift. Also, Gap for Gear makes an excellent set of LUTs for better matching the Marvo to something like, for example, an Ari Alexa. But finally, you might have spotted it already, but there's some funny flares in these images. I think I had a pre-production PL mount that needed some extra flocking internally, and the combo of the Kata Ace and this mount was causing some internal reflections. Please be assured I've not seen that issue with this other PL mount or with other lenses that I've tested. All right, that's it, it was a short trip. Did you like this style of footage walkthrough? Not just showing edited footage, but showing how it handles in the grade? If so, give us a shout in the comments so that we know for future videos. Given the size of these lenses, this footage is mostly handheld or on a monopod. While in New York, I'm using the iFootage Cobra. I love monopods because they give you the stability of a tripod, but without the inconvenience, making it easier to move around the city. I'm powering everything with the excellent Swit Minnow batteries. I love traveling with these because I don't need a dedicated V-mount charger. They charge via USB-C. For audio, I'm using the Audio-Technica BP4025 for ambience, more on that in a bit. Lastly, my presenter audio is captured using the amazing Tentacle Track E 32-bit float recorder. That means I've got a sync also connected to the camera. As the name suggests, this is an improved version of the Marvo LF, which was already a great camera. Noticeable bumps include higher frame rates, integrated SDI outputs, integrated XLR, improved media, and a new button layout. A lot of DPs prefer box cameras for their versatility. You can run the camera lean and mean, go handheld, or build it into a monster rig. Yes, a small mirrorless camera can be built up, but you've got to overcome problems like unstable lens mounts, poorly positioned screens, cumbersome power solutions, and the need for excessive accessories. I've been shooting with Kinefinity cameras for the past three years. I already own a Marvo LF, the Mark I, and I'm gonna pepper footage from this Mark I throughout the video. That seems fair, as it utilizes the same 6K sensor. Some plus points about upgrading. This is my third Kinefinity camera. Firstly, my old monitors from my Mark I Marvo are still compatible. My lens mounts are also still compatible. 
This is one of my favorite things about Kinefinity's ecosystem. The ability to natively adapt the camera to E, EF, PL, LPL, or even micro four thirds. It might be small, but there's an ecosystem here and Kinefinity are rewarding their customers with compatibility as they upgrade. The monitor and EVF are really cool. They connect with a single cable. The monitor has a touchscreen and buttons to stop and start recordings or navigate the menus. The screen comes in two sizes, five inch and seven inch, and both are high bright daylight viewable. What's the camera like to shoot with? First, it's three by two sensor. If you're providing deliverables in different aspect ratios, shooting open gate makes it easier to frame for vertical and HD at the same time. You will find on this camera that the choice of sensor crop size and aspect ratio is staggering. Choose a sensor crop and then select a resolution. And yes, these are downsampled resolutions. On a red, if you want to shoot in HD or UHD, you have to window the sensor. This is the entire sensor being downsampled into UHD in camera. The sensor's 3x2 size also makes it really well suited for anamorphic acquisition because it's taller than a 16x9 full frame sensor. When shooting non-spherical, sensor height is more important than sensor width as the sensor's width is not usually a limiting factor in what can be extracted from an anamorphic lens. For example, typical 2x lenses are designed for a 4 perf 35mm sensor. So you could use the camera's Super 35 4x3 mode, or if you've got a large format expander or are simply using a full frame 2x lens, you can use its full frame 4x3 mode. You get to use the full lens and you'll end up with a native D-squeeze that better matches a 239 target. Or a 1.5x lens like this one will yield an unusually wide 2.67 aspect ratio with a 16x9 sensor. On a 3x2 sensor, it gives you a more moderate 2.25 aspect ratio and a much taller field of view, so you don't need to use as wide a lens. This camera is also really cool for more experimental anamorphic techniques. If I rotate the lens, there's even vertical de-squeeze options for proper monitoring. Its frame rate options are equally as flexible. Set your project frame rate, then set your shooting frame rate. Frame rates top out at 270 frames per second. Similar to other cameras, you can only hit the highest frame rates by windowing or choosing lower resolutions. But what's really unusual about this camera is that you can set custom frame rates all the way down to 0.2 frames per second. How many other cameras do you know that can do that? As a result, I've been able to do this. Use an actual cinema camera to shoot star lapses of the Milky Way. It's a dual native ISO camera, 800 and 5120. I appreciate how high the high base ISO is, as cameras with their second base at something lower, like 3200, don't always give enough reach for low light. The Marvo LF is capable of recording four channels of audio. There's internal microphones for scratch audio. You can connect two channels via the 35mm port on the front and two channels via the two XLRs on the back. The 3.5mm jack is a really nice addition as it allows you to connect prosumer devices like this Sennheiser microphone without bulky adapters. Sample rate and bit depth are fixed at 48,000Hz, 16-bit. Pro inputs are no good without pro quality. So what do the preamps sound like? For our tests, I'm using this stunning microphone from Audio Technica, the BP4025. It's got two one-inch condenser microphones in an XY configuration, so it's stereo. This is the Audio Technica BP4025 mounted on a Ryko Lyre pistol grip connected directly to the camera via XLR. I do have a foam windshield on at the moment to stop pops while I'm talking. I'll be quiet for a moment so you can hear the camera's noise floor. The only processing that has been applied to this clip is to normalize the volume to minus 14 luffs. And here are some samples from New York. The inclusion of XLR in camera makes it more flexible for location work or efficient workflows without separate audio. And unlike cameras like the Sony FX6, a handle or breakout box isn't needed. The EVF is beautiful. It's a fantastic alternative to shooting with a monitor. Both Marvos, the Super 35 and large format have 6K sensors. Now here's why I think that's significant. 
UHD has become a delivery standard. A 6K image allows me to zoom in without losing detail. That's why for me, it's a requirement for any of my primary cameras. The camera's menu systems and controls have been refined over the years too. They're very clean and minimal. Let's take a moment to talk about rigging. The included side rosette is great for attaching a side handle. The included NATO rail on top is good for a follow focus. I like the monitor mounting system that can mount to either the top plate or the top handle, but it's just as easy to use other accessories. I'm using a wooden camera base plate that can interface directly with an RE dovetail. And I always have a patch of Velcro on cameras for accessories like a tentacle sink. I'm a big fan of setting up my cameras so that I do not need tools to reconfigure them. And this is no exception. Finally, let's talk about codecs and memory cards. The old Marvo used 2.5 inch SSDs, which was super cool given how cheap they were. The new Marvo uses these things. Inside are M.2 NVMe SSDs. So it's kind of proprietary, but kind of not. You can buy the enclosure and fit your own SSD or buy their pre-made cards. Not as cheap as the Mark I's media, but still cheaper than formats like CF Express. Codec wise, there's every flavor of ProRes 422 and 444. There's a lot of buzz and hype around RAW. No, this camera cannot shoot RAW. But do you realize how much data a ProRes 4444 file contains? It's 12 bit with no chroma subsampling. That's an insane amount of information. It's unlikely a RAW codec would provide any meaningful increase in image quality, and it would require a more powerful computer for playback. And don't forget, if ProRes 4444XQ is good enough for RE Alexa users, it's definitely good enough here. What don't I like? I wish the camera had internal ND. The more expensive Edge 6K does, but the ND mount adapters are an acceptable compromise. I also wish it had internal gyro recording. I think that's a super useful technology. And again, the Edge 6K also has that. I'm not mad about that. I think it's reasonable that Kinefinity reserve features for their flagship cameras, but the Blackmagic 6K that only costs two and a half thousand pounds does have internal gyro. Rolling shutter performance is average, but it's rarely an issue. No one actually moves their tripod like they do in rolling shutter demos, and gimbals or even the camera's weight can help to mitigate jello. If I were shooting action, this would be a bigger issue, but the corporate and commercial world doesn't move that fast. Finally, the touchscreen is usable, sometimes a little bit frustrating. It's not really an issue though, as you don't need the touchscreen to get the best out of the camera. One of the best touchscreens I've used is Blackmagic's. That's it, that's my list. It's not much though, and very forgivable considering the body only costs $6,000. I really like this camera. That's why the Marvo LF Mark I and Mark II are currently our primary cameras that we use to shoot all our channel, corporate, and commercial content. So please indulge me one moment because I wanna spend some time talking about why it's a great camera that you should take an interest in. To be clear, this isn't a hobbyist or casual camera. It's a camera for a working professional. First, when considering the Marvo Mark II, we need to consider the alternatives. The Red Komodo is a fantastic camera, but it is more expensive and it's only Super 35. It's fairer to compare the Komodo X to the Marvo Super 35 as they have more similar sized sensors. In that case, the Komodo X body only is more than twice the cost of the Marvo Super 35. In fact, you could buy a Marvo package for less than the Komodo body. That package includes media, monitor, rigging, and batteries, and then you'd still have $3,500 left over to spend on lenses and other accessories. What about the FX6 and FX9? Again, great cameras with some very particular advantages. You'll get amazing autofocus with E-mount lenses. They've got internal ND, but neither camera has V-mount. The FX9 is relatively bulky. The FX6 is only 4K, and the handle is required for XLR. And plus, it's not open gate. What about the FX3? It's had a lot of hype recently as it was used to film the creator. Let's put aside that it's only 4K and talk about it for a moment. Can you shoot a feature on a $4,000 mirrorless camera? Yes, but here's what everyone forgets. In every behind the scenes rig picture you've seen, it's had a plethora of other accessories attached to make it production friendly, including external power, a mount adapter, and an Atomos external recorder. We're not including the gimbal in that equation. So in reality, the creator was not shot on a $4,000 camera. It was shot on a rig that cost at least $8,000, perhaps more. One last comparison. What about the Blackmagic Cinema Camera 6K? Again, it's a three x two large format sensor and it's got fantastic internal codecs. And it's almost a third the price of the Marvo LF Mark II. We'll be covering this camera in a future video. Spoiler alert, the camera is amazing but its form factor and I.O. seems to be built with a different use case in mind. We've made a few comparisons, so to set the record straight, 
The Komodo X and V-Raptor are incredible cameras. They have better dynamic range and color science. There's no doubt about that, but they're at least twice the cost. Are they twice as good? No, they're only slightly better. So it's important to find a use case that justifies that expense. Sony and Canon also have amazing cameras, which for example, have incredible autofocus, but I'm not using autofocus right now and I don't use it on crude shoots. In summary, a camera is more than just its image. Missing features come at a cost. That cost might be inconvenience or the extra accessories you need to purchase. Added features also come at a cost. It might be a higher price tag, or it could be a different feature that has been removed to keep the camera's costs down. So cameras can't be compared with a single spec. You need to look at the entire package, an aggregate score, if you will. Just because a Ferrari can go faster than a Ford pickup truck does not make it a better car. For most of us, the Ford pickup is objectively a better choice because practicality and broad usability trumps top speed. You might have a specific need that will influence your camera decision. For example, if you work in high budget narrative where millions are spent on each project, your client demands the highest possible quality. So the cost of an Alexa or a Red Raptor is not an issue. Or if you work in live productions or news, the features of an ENG camera will necessitate a particular choice. But what kind of content are you shooting? What's your bread and butter? Is it weddings? Is it corporate? Is it commercial? Is it narrative? Is it documentary? Do people hire you because of your camera? If the answer is yes, go buy a Sony, Canon or RED. You need the brand recognition. However, do people hire you because of you? Because of the service you offer, the quality you deliver and your hard work? Then you might want to consider purchasing a Marvo Mark II. Not because it has industry leading dynamic range, it doesn't. And it's not because the color science is unmatched. It's amazing, but it's not the best. And it's not because it's the cheapest camera out there. If value is your primary concern, go buy the Blackmagic Cinema Camera 6K. It is amazing and it only costs two and a half thousand dollars. So why buy a Marvo? Well, it looks great on set. It's incredibly professional. It's a joy to rig. Big or small, this camera's got you covered because it's got a sturdy, well-featured core. It has all the I.O. you need without having to add peripherals. It even streams over Wi-Fi, which is perfect for budget monitoring. This camera is insanely flexible. Everything is covered. Its codecs are solid. It's a monster in low light and the quality is amazing. You should consider this camera, and that's all I'm saying, consider it, because it's a very competent all-rounder that won't break the bank. A camera is a business decision, not a matter of vanity. You're looking for a return on investment and you want the shortest possible payback period. After all, an extra half stop of dynamic range will cost you more, but probably won't get you paid more. And in most scenarios, it isn't even utilized. Put it this way, if you can't shoot a decent image with the Marvo LF Mark II, then you've got bigger problems. Lastly, let's address something I've heard people say. I think by now, most people have heard of Kinefinity, but some people are still a little bit skeptical as compared to other industry standards like Ari, Sony and Canon, they are relatively new. But they have been making cameras since 2011. That's well over a decade. And remember the Red One was only released in 2007. So they're only four years younger than Red. They are well into their, by my count, fourth generation of cameras. They've got distributors in Europe, Asia and America, a reputation for reliability and an active community of users. So let's draw a line under that. Kinefinity might be small, but they're definitely legit. Here is a 6K large format camera with internal ProRes and professional connectivity and power integrated directly into the body. And it'll also fit on a Ronin RS2 or RS3 gimbal. There are many great cameras out there, and this is one of them. If you're based in the UK and you'd like to try the Marvo LF Mark II for yourself, get in touch with ProIV and tell them that we sent you. Or if you're ready to make a purchase, there are affiliate links in the description. Thank you so much for using them. It helps support the time and expense that goes into making these videos. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like and make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on future content. Thanks for watching.